This is Ling270, Language, Technology, and Society. In this module, we are examining modern speech technology, including automatic speech recognition and text-to-speech synthesis. In this lecture, we're going to examine the next major component of automatic speech recognition systems, the language model. Let's review what the overall process of automatic speech recognition looks like. The running example that we're using is a user speaking to her smartphone, asking, hey Siri, will it rain today? The speech signal, the sound, comes from the person's mouth and is encountered at the microphone in the device, in the smartphone's device. The microphone includes an analog to digital converter that is responsible for taking the analog audio sound wave and returning a digitized representation. The acoustic model then will extract features from the audio signal. At every frame or time slice, we will take a segment of the speech signal, extract features, and pass that to a hidden Markov model. The hidden Markov model contains two probability distributions, an emission model that models uh, the features and the features matching up with various phones, and a transition model that models this, the probability of going from one phone to another phone. The result is a lattice, or a, sometimes a single sequence of phones. The pronunciation lexicon is a list of words that the, along with their pronunciations. So in the textbook on page 203, we see an excerpt of the Carnegie Mellon University pronunciation lexicon. So this, the, the lexicon has words along with their pronunciations. And the lexicon is used to provide uh, a transition from the list or lattice of phones to a list or lattice of words. The question then is how do we know which sequence of words to choose? Therein lies the, the role of the language model. Let's go to page 204 of the textbook. Again, this is Language, Technology, and Society by Richard Sprout. Here we're going to switch from, hey Siri, what's the weather today, to a different utterance. The utterance here is, she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year. And let's imagine that the pronunciation lexicon in conjunction with the acoustic model has three hypotheses. The first one is the correct hypothesis. The second hypothesis is she had your dark suit in Greece watched all year. And the third hypothesis is jihad, your tar souk increased what's waters, Walter's oily ear. So one of these is very good. That would be the correct one, the first one. One of them is okay, but not perfect. That would be the second one involving the dark soup in Greece. And the third one is just terrible. Jihad, your tar souk increased what's Walter's oily ear. Any speaker of English could tell you that that is nonsense and that that is a very unlikely sequence of words. So that judgment, being able to say the first one sounds very likely given English. 
she had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. I mean, it's a weird sentence, but it's fine. It sounds fine. She had your dark soup and grease watched all year. Sounds less good. And the third one just sounds like nonsense. So that's the job of the language model, making those judgments. This sounds perfectly natural. This is okay, but not great. Or this is garbage. So what does it mean? How do we build a model to make that judgment? Let's switch over to a whiteboard and start drawing out what this might look like. And we're going to take a tiny look into the math involved. So a probability in a language model is going to give us a sequence a probability of an utterance. So the boy went home. Or hey Siri, what's the weather? Or she had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. Or she had your dark soup and grease watched all year. Or Jihaj, your tar soup increased what's Walter's oily ear. So I'm not going to write out all three of those, but we'll put placeholders. So this is hypothesis one, hypothesis two, and hypothesis three. So hypothesis one is she had your dark suit and greasy wash water all year. Hypothesis two is she had your dark soup and grease watched all year. And hypothesis three is Jihaj, your tar souk increased. What's Walter's oily ear? So a probability model is going to give us a number that at the smallest is zero and at the largest is one. So a probability is going to be somewhere in this range. And we would like it to be the case that the probability of hypothesis one is greater than the, excuse me, than the probability for hypothesis two and that the probability of hypothesis two is greater than the probability of hypothesis three. This is what we would like our language model to give us. So that the probability of a fully formed good sentence in English is high, the probability of a nonsense sentence in English is low, and the probability of a sentence that's okay but not great is in between. So how do we build a model like this? Well, let's look at the simplest possible language model, and that would be a unigram language model. So here I'm using LM to stand for language model. So let's say we've got a text. This will be a very simple text. The cat chases mice. The mice like cheese. Okay, so there's two examples. Two example sentences. So a unigram language model would just ask, what is the probability of the? Or what is the probability of cat? So it's going to treat each word in isolation. 
So the way we would do this is count how many times each word occurs and build a table. So the occurs twice, cat occurs once, chases occurs once, like occurs once, mice appears once, and cheese appears once. Now we're going to augment this with a couple of special symbols that mark the beginning of a sentence. So this symbol is just going to represent the beginning of a sentence or beginning of an utterance. And similarly here. And we're going to get rid of the periods because we're dealing with speech. Although in principle, a language model for written text could certainly have punctuation in it. And we'll add an end of sentence symbol. Which means that we also have beginning of sentence occurred twice and end of sentence occurred twice. Now based on these statistics, we can calculate a unigram language model. So let's add up the total number of tokens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So twelve total tokens. And the probability of any word is going to be equal to the number of times that word occurred divided by the total number of tokens, the total number of words. So the probability of the is going to be 2 divided by 12. So if we break out our calculators, that'll give us a particular number. So let's do that. I can find my calculator here. Never mind. Sorry about that. Anyway, it's 2 divided by 12. The probability of cat is going to be 1 divided by 12. So that's a very, very basic language model, but it's not going to be super helpful. We could alternatively do a bigram language model. The bigram language model is going to calculate the probability of a word 2 given word 1. Or more generally, the probability of a word at a particular time given the probability of the word at the previous time. So a bigram language model is going to be able to distinguish the difference between the boy and boy the. So the number of times that we see the boy in a corpus divided by the number of times we saw any two word sequence is going to be a lot higher 
than the number of times we saw boy the divided by any two word sequence. So the denominator here in both of these is the same. It's just the number of two word sequences there were in our corpus. So the boy happens a lot more often than boy the. So the probability of the sequence the boy is going to be much greater than the probability of the sequence boy the. So this is an example of a bigram language model. To generalize this, an n-gram language model is a model that says, what is the probability of a word n given the one through n minus one history. So here we've got word one, word two, word three, dot dot dot, word n. And then there may be more words after that. And the n-gram language model will tell us what is this probability of a sequence of n words. Now, we know that in real text that sentences have different lengths. In real speech, utterances have different lengths. So one important thing to realize in n-gram language models is that n-gram language models make what is called a Markov assumption. So the Markov assumption says, if we have a sequence of words, up to T, let's say we have a sequence of T words, that the probability of the sequence can be approximated by looking at only words up to the Markov limit or the, uh, the history. So in a unigram model, the history is zero. In a bigram model, the history is two. In a trigram model, the history, uh, sorry, in a bigram model, the history is one. In a trigram model, the history is two. In an n-gram model in general, the history is n minus one. And for a very long time through, oh, the beginning of speech recognition through about to 2010, maybe up to 2015, uh, n-gram language models were considered the state of the art in speech recognition and in many other tasks that used language models, including machine translation. Beginning in around 2010 or so, neural language models, so language models based on artificial neural networks came to prominence. So the Textbook doesn't talk too much about this because this occurred after the publication of the textbook. So in a neural language model, you could still calculate language models that use a Markov assumption. So you could still calculate an n-gram language model. But neural language models in general can be set up without the Markov assumption, which allows you to calculate the probability using an essentially unlimited history. Neural language models that don't use the, lang the Markov assumption tend to be more computationally expensive to compute and often rely on large amounts of training data. But for languages where that large amount of training data is available, 
these uh, n these recurrent neural language models have vastly outperformed the traditional n-gram language models. So one of the things that the author in the textbook notes is that uh, n-gram language models have been frustratingly difficult to beat. In the time since the textbook was published, neural language models have been able to do exactly that. So let's go back to our slides. So we've got the person speaking. Hey Siri, what's the weather today? That gets picked up by the microphone. The microphone converts the, the audio signal into a digital signal. The acoustic model then performs feature extraction and uses an HMM to result in a hypothesis lattice of phones. The lexicon then is used to look up pronunciations of possible words and converts the lexicon or converts the lattice of phones into a lattice of words. The language model is then used to score those words. So the language model is going to be able to distinguish between these three sentences. So if the language model was trained on regular English speech, the language model should give a good score to this sentence, hypothesis one. It should give an okay score to this sentence, hypothesis two, and should give a really terrible score to this sentence because it should know, based on the statistics that it's calculated in a corpus, in a training corpus, that jihaj, your tar souk, is a very unlikely sequence of words in English. So, the language model will then give us a one best hypothesis. Will it rain today? Or, hey Siri, will it rain today? At this point, the automatic speech recognition process is essentially complete. So the smartphone has software on it that performs automatic speech recognition. And at this point, other models take over. So a program fetches the weather forecast from the internet and performs, and then a text-to-speech system synthesizes the speech that is spoken back to the user. It doesn't look like it's going to rain today. This essentially concludes our look at automatic speech recognition. The last thing I want to leave you with here is that this lattice of this lattice that the language model scores uh, could have a lot of different possible sentences that come out of it. So if we have a word lattice that includes all of these possibilities, there could be multiple of them. And in principle, it may not be always tractable to exhaustively look at all of the possibilities. The beam search algorithm that's briefly described in this section of the textbook talks about an efficient algorithm for coming up with this one best approach. The final thing to mention is performance. So the author in the textbook refers to uh, performance of red news and noisy speech, speech over the telephone. I'm not going to go into too many numbers here because this, these numbers, these results, get outdated very quickly. So I'm recording this in uh, November of, 2000, uh, of 2020, November 2020. This textbook was written several years ago, and so the numbers here would have been relevant at the time they were, they were published. But since then, 
speech recognition rates have gotten a lot better in a lot more circumstances for English. English has a lot of training data. There are a number of other languages that have sufficient enough training data that we're able to get very good results. So this includes Chinese and many of the major, uh, major European languages. However, there are hundreds and thousands of languages that have absolutely no speech recognition technology that's ever been built for them, and many others that the performance is still very poor. So that's where we're at, uh, and this concludes our look at automatic speech recognition.